Hello and welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. This is your host, Anthony, and with me is my co-host, Greg. In these episodes, our goal is to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Hello, Greg. Hello, Anthony. Hello, everybody. Here we are again. Thanks for tuning in. So, Greg, after our last episode we've titled The Mortality of Man, I thought we'd talk about resurrection today. The last episode sort of ended on a depressing note, and I think we need to talk about the hope we all can have to live again. There's no better time than now, Anthony. I think the last episode really set the stage and, hopefully, piqued our listeners' interest in hearing more. Those of you listening who haven't heard that episode, go ahead and go to the channel page and look under the playlist, Iron Sharpens Iron. The episode you're looking for is episode two, The Mortality of Man. Thanks for that, Greg. So, everyone, in that last episode, we established what the Bible teaches as mortality. In Scripture, death is the opposite of life. Suffice it to say, anything we would describe as life is the absolute opposite in death. That's right. If life means consciousness, emotion, vitality, thought, and the ability to interact with others and our environment, death means the lack of all these things. This is how the Bible describes it, time after time. Death was the result of sin, and it was Paul who wrote, For the wages of sin is death, at Romans 6.23. This truly leaves us all in a difficult spot, because obviously there's none of us who can say they're sinless. Yet, it was Paul who also wrote in that same letter that it was through the one man, Adam, that sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. You'll find that at Romans 5.12. We're all in trouble unless there's some way to get out of that cycle. Well, we certainly can't do it ourselves, that's for sure. Now, here is where we come to the heart of the gospel message. All the promises made by God to his faithful people, including Abraham, through whom the promises of the Messiah and inheritance of the earth came, simply cannot be fulfilled without, well, the faithful people to whom they were made being alive. In Jesus' day, there was a group of Jews known as the Sadducees who didn't believe in resurrection. Jesus had something very interesting to say to them, didn't he? They had come to them asking, really, a pretty ridiculous question about a man who ended up having married seven wives in his lifetime. One died and he married another, on and on, until he had married seven in total. Finally, the man died and he had not fathered any children. They wanted to know from Jesus who this man would be married to after resurrection. Yeah, for sure they weren't sincere in their question. But Jesus really put it to them by what he said. He reminded them that God had told Moses from the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. This may seem insignificant until you realize all three of those men were long dead by the time of Moses. Yet Jesus points out, God used the present tense. I am the God, not I was the God. His meaning is very clear, isn't it? Even though these men were dead, they were not going to be forever dead. Jesus proved the truth of resurrection by showing them the simple present tense used in God's words. Jesus went on to tell them that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You can find this conversation in the 12th chapter of Mark. Indeed. After all, Abraham received many promises from God that were never fulfilled in his lifetime. The 11th chapter of Hebrews gives many, many examples of faithful men and women who faithfully obeyed God, who had received promises, but never received what was promised. Speaking of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Hebrews 11, 8, and 9 says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Just a few verses below this, the writer of Hebrews tells us, 
these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. That's powerful. It should be pointed out that none of these promises had anything to do with being rewarded in heaven or with being a disembodied spirit after death. These promises had to do with inheritance of physical land. Since they all have died, there is simply no other way for God to fulfill His promises than to resurrect these people back to a physical life on the earth. That's it, Anthony. Through Jesus the Messiah, the promises made to Abraham can be extended to us. Paul wrote at Galatians 3.29, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. But just like Abraham, if we die before those promises are fulfilled, we must wait to be resurrected before receiving them. Yeah, Greg, that reminds me of what the last two verses of Hebrews 11 says. Speaking of all the faithful who've died, it says, And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Being made perfect speaks of resurrection, doesn't it? That's right. And resurrection is the only way those promises can be realized. If our listeners wish, they can review these promises by reading the 22nd chapter of Genesis. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks in length about these promises to Abraham and to his seed or offspring. Romans chapter 4 verses 13 through 25 is a great place for our listeners to begin. In those verses, Paul said of Abraham, for the promise that he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his offspring through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Imagine, he was promised to become heir of the world. Uh, you mean he wasn't promised heavenly bliss at death? All kidding aside, in order for Abraham to inherit the world, and as Paul goes on in Romans chapter 4, in order for all who follow after who are of the faith of Abraham, to inherit anything is through resurrection. No dead person can inherit anything. Well, that's right. Probably the best place for our listeners to read about the hope of resurrection as being our only hope is the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul argued in verses 16 through 19, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people the most pitied. Here, Paul didn't seem to think heavenly bliss was a hope for any believer. He went so far as to say, if there is no resurrection, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That certainly seems clear to me. Well, thanks, Greg. Hopefully, this was helpful for someone out there. Hopefully. I can't overemphasize the need to read the Scriptures carefully and naturally. We simply cannot come to the Bible with preconceived notions. Just let the writers say what they say. That's right. So until next time, this has been Anthony and Greg on Iron Sharpens Iron. It's in these episodes where we aim to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Have a blessed day. 